2 Corinthians chapter 5. In this chapter, Paul is describing his ministry as an apostle, what characterizes it, what motivates it, and what its ultimate aim is. And so let's read these words inspired by the Spirit regarding the Apostle Paul and his ministry as an apostle, beginning in verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are also made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart." For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. If you were here last week, then hopefully you'll remember that we discussed one of the components of discipleship to Jesus, which was rest. And I mentioned in passing last week that first comes rest, and then comes zeal. First we rest in Jesus, and it is out of that rest that we then live lives of zeal for Jesus. And this morning we are considering the topic of zealous living for Jesus. As you've maybe noticed on the bulletin, the title for the sermon is Essential Elements of Christian Zeal. Essential Elements of Christian Zeal. Most of us appreciate stories of great zeal. Stories that have to do with someone who has set their mind on something and is determined to get it no matter the cost. And so we love stories like Chris Gardner, who was a homeless man taking care of his young son, who overcomes every obstacle, is undeterred in his pursuit of eventually and finally becoming a successful businessman. Or we love stories like that of Daniel Rudiger, a.k.a. Rudy, some of you may remember from the 90s film, who didn't have the size or the grades or the money 
to play football for Notre Dame, and yet he was determined to dress up and play college football for them. And so out of determination, having his mind set on the goal, he worked and he worked and he worked until one day he finally went out onto the field in a Notre Dame jersey to the cheering crowd, Rudy, Rudy. And maybe the most inspiring of all, Marlin the Clownfish, who out of, out of pure determination to find his lost son, did not stop in the face of every danger, but swam across the ocean until he finally found Nemo. We love stories of zeal and determination and grit and ambition. And we love stories like that for a reason. It's because God has made us to be ambitious people. He has designed us to be zealous creatures. We are created in the image of God. Is God a stoic, apathetic, indifferent, cold-hearted being? No. Michael mentioned earlier in his prayer that God is zealous for his glory. God is zealous for his people. God is zealous for the truth. And as his image bearers, he has made us to follow in his footsteps and to be zealous creatures. We were not designed to live apathetic, stoic, aimless lives. We were designed and redeemed to live with wholehearted, all-consuming desire to pursue one thing, the glory of our maker, and to enjoy him with every fiber of our being. So this morning, we're considering the topic of zeal, what it looks like to live a zealous life for Christ. Dr. Joel Beakey describes Christian zeal as the grace that invigorates and inflames all of our affections toward a sole purpose, and more specifically, a holy purpose. I'll read that again. Zeal is the grace that invigorates or inflames all of our affections toward a holy purpose. Christian zeal is the opposite of apathy and aimlessness. It's what enlivens our desires. It's what enlivens our determination to seek one thing, the glory of God and the enjoyment of our maker. We're, we're reminded a number of times in the scriptures that God's people are to be marked by zeal. We read earlier in Titus chapter 2 at the end of the chapter that we were redeemed ultimately in order that Christ might purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good deeds. That's why Christ redeemed you, so that you would be zealous for good deeds, ambitious in your pursuit of good deeds. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus writes a letter to the church of Laodicea, reproving them for their lack of love, their, their lukewarmness. And in that reproof, he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Turn away from your cold-hearted indifference. Be zealous. Repent. Romans 12, verse 11 says that we're not to be lagging behind in diligence. Literally, that could be translated, not lagging behind in zeal. We shouldn't be lacking in zeal. Of course, most convincingly, the reason we ought to be zealous is because it's what we see in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus was zealous in his pursuit of doing what was pleasing to his father. He was zealous for his father's honor. We read as he goes in and cleanses the temple that the scriptures were speaking about him when, it, when they said, zeal for your house will consume me. I will be consumed by zeal for the honor of my father. It was written about Jesus. And not just in that momentary instance, but the whole life of Jesus is characterized by a wholehearted, unwavering determination to do nothing but was what was honoring and pleasing to his Father in heaven. His affections were fully enlivened, fully inflamed, his energy completely devoted toward one thing, the pleasing of the one who sent him. And so as we seek then to be shaped more and more into the image of Christ, which certainly, I hope you would agree, is our desire more than anything else in the world, to be shaped into the image of Jesus, as we seek to be molded and shaped into the image of Christ, it will necessarily involve us growing in a Christ-like zeal. 
The specific question I want to ask this morning is how do we grow in our zeal for the Lord? How do we grow it? How do we cultivate it? Because I can stand up here and condemn both you and myself for the times that we often lack zeal. I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say they are as zealous for Christ as they wish they were. If you belong to Jesus, you also recognize you don't live for Jesus as much as you wish you would. There are often times where your zeal is lacking. It's lagging behind, and we need Paul's exhortation to us again and again and again. Do not be lagging or lacking in zeal. So how do we cultivate it, and what does it look like to cultivate it? Well, I want to answer that question by looking at the example of the Apostle Paul. We read from 2 Corinthians 5. We'll get there in just a moment. But I want to begin with Paul's life. Apart from Jesus Christ, I don't think there's ever been another individual who has ever lived on the face of the earth who has been as zealous as the Apostle Paul. From the moment of his conversion until his death, his martyrdom, he was zealous in his pursuit of Christ. In his own words, Philippians 3, verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Paul, quite literally, lost everything in his ministry as an apostle. He gave up everything, and it doesn't take much in-depth study of the New Testament to see what that looked like in his life. Persecution after persecution, suffering after suffering, disappointment in churches after disappointment in churches. Again and again, Paul suffered. He gave up everything in order to gain Christ, to live for him. And then in Acts 20, verse 24, this is when Paul is he, he's determined to go to Jerusalem to testify of the grace of the gospel. He's determined to go there, to travel there, even though he's been warned both by the Holy Spirit directly and by others in his life that if he goes there, it's going to not end well for him. If he goes to Jerusalem, he, he says, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and affliction await me there. I know it's not going to be good, but I must go there and I must preach the gospel. This is what he says. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. In his determination to preach the gospel, in his, the, the amount, the degree to which he valued the proclamation of the glory of Christ, the grace of Christ, compared to that, he didn't consider his life even something to be mentioned. It wasn't worth taking into account. He would lay down his life in pursuit of the proclamation of the glory of Christ. He was zealous, which raises the question, what drove the Apostle Paul? What motivated him? What moved him, compelled him to live that kind of life for Christ? Perhaps nowhere does the Apostle Paul answer that question more clearly than he does in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verses 14 to 15. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul is explaining to us there the inner workings of his heart and his fellow co-workers when it comes to to their zealous life of ministry for Christ. And so using his example then, I want to look at three elements of zealous living for Christ. What does it look like to live zealously for Jesus? And we'll notice from those two verses the motivation, the foundation, and the aim of zeal. The motivation of zeal, the foundation of our zeal, and the aim of our zeal. And hopefully as we hear those things, we'll also ask ourselves, are these things present in our lives? And we'll be praying, God, help me to cultivate these things in my life. The motivation, the foundation, and the aim of Christian zeal. So let's begin with the motivation of Christian zeal, specifically motivated by the love of Christ. Paul says in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. That word control It has to do with being compelled or driven or carried along, pressed forward 
in a particular direction. So some have compared it to river banks on either side of a river that keep that river constrained and force it to move in a certain direction. One of the images that comes to my mind in thinking about being controlled in this way by Christ's love is uh, my experience on the, on the Mexico City subway. If you know, Mexico City has uh, over 10 million people living in the greater metropolis. And I think all 10 million of those people come to the subway most days. And, and so as you're in the subway station, you're surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of people working their way in one direction in the morning and another direction in the evening as they go toward the, sub, uh, the subway. And in the middle of that crowd, it's basically as though you're being carried along. You don't have really any ability to, to go to the right or to the left. You certainly have no ability to go backwards because there are thousands of people compelling you forward in one direction. The Apostle Paul is saying, the love of Christ, it compels me. I can't go in a different direction. I can't go backwards. I can't go to the right and I can't go to the left because I am constrained by and pressed forward by the love of Christ, which raises the question, whose love is Paul talking about? Is it the love of Christ that Paul has toward Christ or is it Christ's love toward him? Well, it's hopefully not too difficult for us to answer that question. Let me ask you, is it your love for Christ that is a compelling force day after day after day in your life? Or is it Christ's love for you that is a compelling force that never changes? Certainly, Paul has in mind here the latter, not the former. It is Christ's love for him. Specifically, the love of Christ revealed and demonstrated in the death of Christ that day after day compels Paul and motivates him and moves him toward a life of devotion to Jesus. It's the love of Christ for him, as it's evidenced in the death of Christ on his behalf, which is why Paul says not only is he controlled by the love of Christ, but he says, having concluded this, that one died for all. The love of Christ is seen in this, that he died for us. How do you know that Jesus loves you? He died for you. How do you know that Jesus loves you now? He died for you. How do you know that Jesus will love you through all eternity? He died for you. He gave his life Over and over again, as we read through the New Testament, we find that the love of Christ is connected to its evidence in the cross. If you were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, how do you know Jesus loves you? He would say something like Galatians 2.20, that he loved me and he gave himself up for me. Or he would say something like he does in Ephesians 5, verse 1, that we should walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for you. Or he would say something along the lines of what Jesus said in John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. How do you know that Jesus loves you? He died for you. Paul could not contemplate the cross. He couldn't contemplate the death of Jesus without remembering the love of Christ and having it penetrate his heart. Many of us have certain items that we possess that have Uh, perhaps been given to us that remind us of someone significant in our lives. Uh, Shortly before my grandfather passed away uh, several years ago, he gave me a mandolin that he had purchased when he was a young man. Uh, I think it was in the 50s that he had he had bought it, a mandolin, and he loved it. It was one of his his most cherished possessions. And the last time, uh, sorry, not the last time, one of the last times I ever saw my granddad he called me into the sunroom in the back of their house, and he got out his mandolin, and he gave it to me. And he said, I want you to have this mandolin. And he knew, and I knew, that that exchange was about something far more than the mandolin itself. It was an expression of his love. My granddad loved his grandson. And now when I go upstairs in my house, and I see the mandolin there sitting on the shelf, I can't look at it without remembering the love that my granddad had for me. And Paul is saying that to a far greater degree, an incomparably greater degree, every time we contemplate the death of Christ on the cross for us, it ought to stir our hearts to remember, he loved me, he loved me, he loves me, he will always love me, he died for me. Paul was motivated by that daily reminder, that daily assurance, moment by moment, Christ died for me, and that love controlled him, it compelled him motivated him toward a zealous life for Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that love, the love of Christ, was the only motivation in Paul's life. If you were following along as we read in 2 Corinthians 5, there's an element of fear 
and living a zealous life for Christ. So we've got to have a, a full orbed view of what it looks like to serve Jesus. We're motivated by his love, but there is an element of fear as well. Because we know that one day we're going to give an account for the life that we live. Not, not, as to, uh, not with regard to whether we're condemned in hell. If we're in Christ, you'll never be condemned. But with regard to the commendation of our Savior. One day all of us will present our lives before our Savior and we will be commended for our labors for him by his grace. And, and what Paul wanted was on that day to be able to lay his life down before Jesus and, and hear the words of commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Paul knew that that day was coming, and he, and he lived a life of fear in the sense of reverence, sobriety, not wanting to waste his life on worthless things, but wanting to be single-mindedly devoted towards service to his Savior. But we can't understand fear apart from the preeminent motive in Paul's heart, which was love. The fear of Christ is never separated from the love of Christ in the apostle's mind. The love of Christ was the foundational motive for him. It was the essential motive for his devotion to Christ. It wasn't guilt. It wasn't that Paul wanted to, to prove that he was worthy of Christ's love. It was the fact that he had already been loved by Christ. That it was the compelling force to serve him, to labor for him. And the same must be true of us. The measure of our zeal for Christ will be proportionate to the measure of our grasp of his love for us, which is why Paul prays in Ephesians 3, oh, that you would know how deep the love of Christ is for you. It goes beyond all comprehension, that you would know the greatness of his love. And then he immediately goes in chapter 4 into, therefore walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. It starts with knowing the love of Christ, understanding that he has loved you and he has died for you. And it's only when we grasp that that we can move to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of that calling. We will be zealous for Christ to the degree that we have an understanding of the love of Christ for us and that we really believe it. And so it's worth asking ourselves then this morning, what's motivating you? What moves you? What compels you in life? Is the love of Christ often on your mind as you consider the cross is the love of Christ often on your mind as you go about your daily tasks? Are you remembering, being moved by the reality of a Savior who loved you and loves you still? Would your life reflect the words of the hymn, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Jesus has loved us with a perfect love and it demands, it controls, it compels us now. If we've really understood it to the degree that we have understood it, it compels us to live a life of zeal for him. So that's the first thing we discover about zeal then from the example of the Apostle Paul is that it's motivated by the love of Christ. That's the motivation. And then secondly, we find the foundation of it. It's rooted in our identity in Christ. The foundation of zeal is our identity in Christ. Notice that Paul doesn't only put emphasis on the death of Christ and his love in, displayed in his death, but he also points to the change that takes place in us because of Christ's death. He says, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. That is a statement of identity, of position, of spiritual condition in the sight of God. When Jesus was crucified... He died as our substitute. He died in our place. And not only did he die in our place for us, but what Paul is saying is when he died in our place for us, we also died in him. His death is our death, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Repeatedly, we're, we're told in the scriptures that the moment that we are united to Christ at conversion is the moment you and I died. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Romans 6, verses 5 to 6. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Your old self was crucified with Christ. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 3, 
Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You've died. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you died. You were crucified. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that you came to your end the moment that you died in Christ? Well, it means that when we become united to Christ through faith, our old identity ceased. It was terminated. It was done away with. And we were given a new identity. When we died with Christ, it means we've become united with him so that we no longer are what we used to be. So the scriptures very clearly define us in our old identity, in our sin, as children of wrath, as enemies of God, as hostile toward the commands of God, as children of Satan, as strangers to the promises of God, as those who have no hope in the world, as those who live in the domain and the dominion of darkness and of sin, and as those whose ruling principle in our heart was enmity toward God, hostility toward him, and enslavement to sin. If you were to ask yourself prior to coming to Christ, who are you? That's who you were. A slave to sin and hostility and enmity and separation from God. But when you put your faith in Christ, you died to that old self. Your identity completely changed. It was put to death. And in that very moment, you ceased to be who you used to be. He died for all, therefore all who are united to him also died. And not only did you die, but you were also raised up as something new. First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a few verses down in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Your identity in Christ is one of a new creature. That's who you are. Not the old creature, a new creature. You've been united to Jesus. You live this moment as one who is eternally uh, unsepar inseparable from your king, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never be ripped away from him. You are united to Christ now and forever if you are a believer. You've been transferred into his kingdom. You used to live in that kingdom of darkness and the dominion of sin as one who was in your old identity, separated from Christ. But you've been crucified to that old person. You have been transferred into a new kingdom. And you live under the domain and the rule of his grace and his love and his mercy. You have his life living in you. You have his spirit dwelling in you. You are a new creature. You've been raised up to be something new. You're no longer the old person. That person died in the death of Christ. You are the new person, the new self that Christ has made you. Now what does all of that have to do with zeal? How does an understanding of our identity in Christ as those who have died to the old self and are now new creatures in Christ, how does our understanding of our identity affect the way that we seek to live a zealous life for Christ? Well, it establishes it on its proper foundation. It's the foundation of our zeal. When we pursue a zealous life for Christ, it's not because we are anxiously seeking to become something. When we pursue a zealous life for Christ, it's because we are convinced that in Christ we have already become what he has recreated us to be. Even as believers, we are still prone to try to find identity and meaning in so many different things. And if we're not careful, then even this attempt to live a zealous life really just becomes about us trying to establish an identity for ourselves. We read a book on what it looks like to live a radical life for Jesus, and, and, or, or we, we hear the expectations of people around us about what a radical life for Jesus looks like. And, and so out of this desire to establish ourselves in an identity that we can be proud of, we pursue a life of zeal. Maybe it's to prove ourselves, to prove our worth. If I'm really valuable in this church, then, then if that's my identity, if, 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 if I'm going to be someone who is recognized as an important Christian, then I must be zealous. Or, or it may be an attempt to uh, fit in, to, to feel like we're part of the, the club. We see other Christians doing zealous things, and so we think, well, if I'm going to be a zealous Christian, if I'm going to be identified as someone who fits in with this crew over here, then I need to be zealous. And so really our zeal is just a pursuit of identity, wanting to belong, wanting to be accepted. 
It might be rooted in a prideful desire to have the identity of superiority. I am zealous. All the other Christians around me live lukewarm lives. I'm so much better than other people. And so we're searching for identity, even when it comes to zeal. The foundation is all wrong when that, when that happens. The foundation of all Christian zeal is not the pursuit of identity. It is the foundation of our identity that we've already been given in Christ. You don't need to work hard to prove yourself. You already belong. You don't need to work hard to fit in. Jesus has already accepted you. You don't need to work hard to prove that you're not a waste of redemption. Jesus knew all of your failures before he purchased you by his blood. And he's brought you into his family. That is your identity. His brother, a child of God, accepted and beloved, now and forever. And it is out of that identity that we now pursue a zealous life for Jesus. And so again, a simple question to ask yourself as you sort through what it looks like to live a zealous life for Christ, and as you try to cultivate a zeal for the Lord Jesus, a simple question to ask yourself would be, are you daily reminding yourself of your identity? Not only daily, because that's insufficient. Throughout the day, are you reminding yourself of who you are? You're not living zealously in order to become something you're not. You're living zealously because of what Christ has already made you. And if zeal is going to be something produced in your life, then it starts, first of all, with an understanding of who you are by the grace of Christ. So as you live as a member of this church or someone who attends this church, as you go out into the world and into the workplace, into the classroom, into the home, are you reminding yourself of Paul's words? Christ died for all, therefore all died. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. The foundation of our zeal is our identity, the new identity that Christ has given us. And then thirdly, the aim of our zeal. Our zeal is directed toward pleasing Christ. It's directed toward pleasing Christ. Verse 15 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again, on their behalf. The purpose of your new life in Christ is to live for your Redeemer. The aim and the focus of all of our Christian zeal must be pleasing our King, our Lord, our Savior. We read earlier in verse 9 that this was Paul's ambition. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. To do what is pleasing to Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, there it's talking about immorality and our need to pursue purity with our bodies. It says, for you have been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You're not your own, Paul is saying. You don't belong to yourself. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify the one who has purchased you. Seek to please him with your life. And remembering that the aim of our zeal is to please Christ is helpful because it puts zeal in its proper context. Some of us may have a tendency to think of zeal as necessarily synonymous with some form of radical extreme lifestyle. And, and certainly any Christian life is going to be radical or extreme when contrasted with the ways of the world. But we have in mind those things that we think of as radical or extreme when we think of being zealous for Christ. At least some of us have a tendency to think that way. The person who is truly zealous for Christ is the person who leaves everything and goes to the mission field. Or the person who is truly zealous is the, is, is the person who stands up in the city streets and preaches while being mocked and scorned by the surrounding crowds. Or the, the person who is Zealous is, is the person who willingly devotes themselves to poverty in order to bless other people. Or it's the person who leaves their, their well-paying, full-time job in order to devote themselves to full-time gospel ministry, whatever that might look like. It, it looks like some form of lifestyle out there. That's a zealous lifestyle, we tend to think. But we shouldn't assume that those sorts of things are necessarily synonymous with zeal for Christ. And I, I, let me be quick to clarify, 
I hope that in our zeal for Christ, we want to proclaim the gospel everywhere we go. And I hope that in our zeal for Christ, some of us might be willing to even give up everything and go to the mission field. I I hope that God calls individuals from this congregation to leave everything behind and go somewhere else and preach Christ where he's not being preached. Certainly, that would be a good expression of zeal. But we shouldn't assume that those sorts of things necessarily are synonymous with zeal. Because on the one hand, you can do all of those things and you can lack zeal, true zeal. And it's possible to have true zeal and not have any of those things. Because the question that we're asking when we ask, what does it look like for me to live zealously for Christ, is not the question, first of all, what makes me feel most zealous for Christ? The question that we're asking is, what is most pleasing to Christ? I can do lots of things that feel very zealous to me, but the very act of doing them would cause me to forsake the very things that are pleasing to Christ. And so the foundational question that we're asking is, what's the aim of zeal? It is to please my Savior. What does that look like? Again, it might look like some of those things, but more likely, it looks like you being zealously faithful in the little or great responsibilities that God has given you day after day. You remember we read Titus 2, and it ends with that statement that Christ has purified us to be a people who are zealous for good deeds. What are the good deeds that you and I are to be zealous in? Well, if we were just to look at that context, Titus 2, what are the deeds that we're to be zealous in? Is it going to the mission field or preaching the gospel in the streets? Both of those very good things. But is that what Paul is talking about when he says that you are to be zealous for good things? Well, he says, older men, you should be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. In other words, older men, be zealous by being a steady, godly man. Older, older women, you should be reverent in your behavior. You should help and encourage younger women. You should be godly. Younger women, love your husbands, love your children. Be pure, be kind. Younger men, be sensible. Don't be foolish, don't be rash, don't be unthinking, don't be careless. Be sensible, zealously pursue a sensible life. Bond slaves, be argumentative, not don't be argumentative. Don't be dishonest, but instead work hard. Be faithful. We could translate that into the workplace. Employees, if you want to be zealous for Christ, don't be argumentative. Don't be dishonest. Work hard in the tasks that are given to you. Be faithful. Zealously pursue faithfulness in the things that God has entrusted to you. None of those things are particularly extreme or radical at first thought. They are particularly radical when we think that we can only do it by the grace and the power of God's Spirit. And so to be zealous is to zealously pursue God's help by His mercy, by His Spirit, to be faithful people. In other words, what Paul has in mind here is that our lives should be thoroughly characterized by a zealous pursuit to be full of the fruit of the Spirit in every last detail, great and small. Christ is pleased when you are zealous toward faithfulness. And so maybe that looks for you like seeking to zealously be patient and gentle with your children's repeated temper tantrums and difficulties. Or maybe it looks like you sitting at your office and working on another seemingly meaningless task, boring task, one that you have very little interest in, and yet zealously pursuing to be faithful in that task because you know it's pleasing to your Savior. That's what gives it meaning. That's what gives it value. Or maybe it looks like you sitting in the classroom or being with your roommates, determined to be the most joyful, self-controlled, kind, loving person you can be because it's those sorts of things in the daily events of our lives that mark someone who is truly zealous for the honor of Christ. We do all of those things because we want to please him. How many people have we seen or or, or experienced in our own lives who seemed so zealous in the outward things? Pastors, perhaps, missionaries, people that professed faith in Christ, so faithful in the seemingly more spiritual things, and yet their life comes crashing down because they've been faithless 
in the small things. We don't want to be people who are zealous for all of those things out there and yet fail to be zealously faithful in the things God has immediately entrusted to us. Our zeal must be directed toward the ultimate aim of pleasing our Savior in the big details of your life, those big decisions you make, but probably more significantly in the small details of your life, the small decisions you make day after day, seeking to zealously honor and please your Savior. Well, I'll conclude uh, this, this morning's sermon from, with the words from Revelation chapter 5, reminding us that the one we serve is worthy of everything that we could ever give him. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The Lamb of God who was slain for you is worthy of your wholehearted devotion. If you're aware this morning of areas in your life that you have lacked zeal for Christ, I'm not telling you go home and be condemned and paralyzed by guilt. I'm telling you, remember how worthy the lamb is who was slain for you. It's not helpful for a husband who has failed his wife to then just sit down over here and mope in his failure. That's not what his wife wants from him. What his wife most needs and wants from him is for him to to come again and love her and serve her with all of his heart. That's what Christ wants from us. If we realize that our life has lacked in zeal in any particular area, then we ought to say, Lord, forgive me. I repent and now give me grace that I might zealously pursue you. When I'm in my living room with my family, when I'm in the workplace, when I'm in the classroom, when I'm with friends and neighbors, God, help me. The lamb is worthy of my life. Give me grace that I might zealously pursue his glory in word and in thought and in deed. May God help us toward that end. May he make us a people who are zealous after the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, first of all, that you have not saved us because of the quality of our zeal. We thank you that our confidence before your throne, the confidence that we have to draw near to you this morning, is not because we have been sufficiently zealous for your glory this past week. We recognize that all of us, in one way or another, have fallen far short of the kind of zeal and love and obedience that you've called us to in Christ. And so, Father, we do come and we pray that you would forgive us for the ways that we've fallen short. And at the same time, we acknowledge, God, we want to live full lives, wholehearted lives, aimed at the glory and the pleasure of Christ. We pray that you would help us to be motivated by your love for us as it's been demonstrated in the death of Christ. Help us to see the cross and remember and believe that Christ loves us. God, help us to pursue zeal from the foundation of the the new identity that Christ has given us and help us to do all things by your spirit. Lord, we need your help. We need your power. Help us to do all things with the ultimate aim of bringing glory to Christ our King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.